Um, so this is uh, Matt's presentation on deploying your M uh, machine learning model. Um, Matt is a QMind alum and is currently working at uh, Think Data Works in Toronto. Take it away, Matt. <laughs> thank you for the introduction, Trav. Um, yeah, hey everyone, thank you so much for joining my presentation. Super psyched um, that you got to give it, and uh, hope you're all having a good Camp QMind. So let's just dump or jump right into it. Um, so today I'm talking about how to deploy your ML model. All right, so I'm going to cover um, a little bit about how to optimize your sort of machine learning algorithm, get it so that it can um, scale using distributed computing. And uh, then we're going to talk about a couple of different deployment strategies uh, that you can use. And finally, wrap it up with how to monitor your model and make sure it stays up to date. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. I'm I guess technically in my fourth year of Enstris Comp, um, super cool discipline. Uh, surprising me on a crossover between sort of this computational physics and um, data science. So I, that's been awesome. And yeah, I've been a QMind member for the past two years. And right now I'm actually on an internship. So instead of doing it through Quip, I'm basically just deferring my year and splitting it up between three different companies. So right now, I'm at um, a tech startup called Think Data Works in Toronto. I'm still working as a data scientist for the next uh, eight months. And this summer, I worked at Amazon as a software development engineer. Um, and that was cool. So I, when I was at Amazon, I was actually building this uh, AWS architecture that would allow you to sort of deploy some of their ML models in like a robust, um, scalable way. So that was really awesome. But today, let's actually start talking about parallelizing your code. Um, so this is gonna be um, talking about distributed computing. And basically what that is, is it's nothing super fancy. I found a definition, it's called, um, it's a model in which components of a software system are shared among multiple computers. So basically we can use it to share the computational load of running your model over various processing units, over various computers, basically. And so it makes it faster to run your code and makes it capable of handling larger amounts of data. So that's cool. How do we actually do it? So we're gonna have to talk a little bit about something called functional programming. And so that's um, the process of building software uh, using what are called pure functions while avoiding things called uh, shared services and or shared states and side effects. So you basically want to write your code um, so that there are no shared variables, um, which are essentially variables that have a scope um, beyond the function. So it's like it's a global scope, and you want to build your code so that you can actually run it in isolated um, systems that don't depend on each other. So you want to get rid of all these interdependencies so that the nodes execute by themselves. And then talking a little bit about pure functions, so that's nothing fancy. It's basically just a static function, function that depends only on their arguments. So again, there's no sort of global variable that would change the um, performance of the function. So if you ran it multiple times with the same inputs, you would always get the same outputs. And so that's cool. How do we sort of implement that in um, Python. So that's where PySpark comes in, or Spark, um, which is pretty awesome. So at its core, Spark is an engine that helps you process large amounts of data over a cluster of different machines. Um, so it takes care of all the um, sort of complicated handling and scheduling um, using what's called a resilient uh, distributed data set which is basically some PySpark data structure that hides all the compl complexity of transforming and distributing your data across these clusters um, using its sort of internal clustering or its inter internal scheduler. Um, and a really cool part about um, RDDs is what they're called, is that they're evaluated lazily. So that means um, when you perform an operation on your data set, if it's of the proper type, 
nothing actually happens until you need the data. So it allows you to build up this stack of basically multiple transformations without actually um, doing anything to the data. And that's, that's pretty awesome because it allows you to deal with a lot, um, large amounts of data because Matt, I think you went on uh, mute there. Hello. Hey. There, now you're working. Okay. Um, what did you hear last? Um, kind of go back like 20 seconds, probably. 20 seconds. All right. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So um, these RDDs, what they allow you to do is um, process large amounts of data because, yeah, everything's being pointed to. So there's no data actually in memory until you needed it, until you need to actually analyze and load it. And then once you um, are done with it, then it's, it basically gets deleted again. So you can just constantly um, handle big data sets without actually loading and dealing with the, uh, sort of the memory concerns of your big data set. Um, and yeah, so let's go over a couple of best practices, I guess. So of course, use functional programming, um, sort of like look into it a little bit more and understand how it can be done and some of the strategies behind it. Of course, use RDDs, use the data frames. Don't use dictionaries when trying to um, make your code parallel parallelizable. Um, data frames are much easier to sort of execute row by row than dictionaries are. Um, avoid loops. So yeah, loops are kind of they're the death of parallelization. It uh, just because each row that you're iterating over has to be executed um, in sequence. So you can't, it's, you can't parallelize it. You have to sort of vectorize your code um, with these what are called pure functions. And then, yeah, finally, don't pull the data into memory unless you need it. So you can even um, add the operation of reading the CSV. You can add that onto the um, transformation stack that you're, that you're building. So that sounds really cool. So that's going to speed up your algorithm, allow you to handle lots of data. But it, it has its limitations. So even... Um, running on multiple CPUs, the sort of the relationship between your performance gain and the number of CPUs isn't linear. It, uh, it actually plateaus. So here's just a, a simple graph where it shows on the horizontal, the number of processors from one to several thousand, and then sort of the speed up gain that you can expect. So the top um, orange line, I think, was code that's 95% um, parallelizable. And it, it can only get up to a 20 um, times increase in speed, which is, which is still very good. But it's not, gonna, it's not the end solution. There's still some other um, algorithmic improv improvements that you could probably make to really um, optimize your algorithm. And the reason why there's this plateau is because of sort of a communication time um, cost that goes with running on a cluster of nodes. All right, so your code's optimized. And now we're going to talk a little bit about actually deploying it. Um, so you need a deployment strategy because um, you can have a completely incredible, innovative, and accurate model. Um, but if it's not deployed in such a way that allows you to actually integrate it uh, with your firm's operations so you can leverage the information that it produces, then, then it's just simply not going to be useful. Um, so an example of this was when they first developed um, like these credit card fraud detection algorithms. Um, it wasn't, it was awesome. It was a super innovative te technology, but it wasn't adopted right away. It felt a lot of pushback um, from industry. And it wasn't until that they could actually um, transition it and build a simple system which flags these fraudulent transactions, allows the banker to wave it through or um, investigate the uh, 
the transaction more. Building that sort of mundane system is actually what made it appealing to the banks and made it worth purchasing. So when it comes to um, deploying it, you need to really figure out what the uh, what your use case is and what the business requirements are of your project and how your output is consumed, essentially. So there's, there's a ton of different strategies, but I'm just gonna sort of talk on four um, broad and common uh, classifications that you might see or might think of that fits your project. So the first one is batch prediction. So that's really what most QMI projects are gonna look like. So the predictions are um, scheduled to run at a certain time and they collect a whole big batch of data from like, let's say the day's worth of data and then they execute the pre and predict on that. And then they store the predictions in a database or some sort of um, storage machine. Now, moving to more sort of a real time execution, you've got a web service deployment. And so this service um, takes the input parameters and outputs the predictions in real time so it doesn't wait for multiple um, requests and it, it does it very quickly and does it when it's needed to. And so because of this, it doesn't require a ton of resources. It's only predicting on one record at a time. Um, these approaches are good, but they, they're, and they're very common, but they're not um, perfect. So they're very synchronous. So they wait for each request um, to go through. And if there's a failure, it could really um, block up the whole system. So we moved to these the last two ones, um, which sort of utilize streaming essentially and allow you to modify your model as you go. So the first one is real time streaming. Um, here the requests come to the model um, as a stream of events actually. And then it basically runs those requests um, through the hose or through the model like it's a fire hose. Um, so it runs as it enters the system. But now this is asynchronous, um, so it's more fault tolerant. Uh, it's very replayable, and it can be scaled quite easily. The final one, um, which is, I guess, the least common one, but it's it's becoming more and more common because it's um, so adaptable. Really. So what this does is it actually learns on the fly. So it uh, it takes um, advantage of uh, real-time predicting, and it can also learn from the real-time new data. So it's the most difficult to engineer, um, but it can be incredibly, incredibly effective. So the model is basically constantly changing, um, so you can't scale it horizontally, right? You can't have multiple instances of this model because it's constantly changing. And so it makes it harder to um, sort of parallelized as we saw before, but on multiple machines. Um, so an example of an application of this would be something like self-driving cars or like the LinkedIn's connection suggestions where it's constantly giving you new connections. Um, yeah, so that's a couple um, sort of categories to think about where your project might fit. Um, but now we're going on to monitoring. So this is essentially the last um, section of the data science project lifecycle. So you've got your model built, you've got it integrated in the system and it's deployed, but uh, unfortunately your job's not over, right? Since the world's constantly changing, people are constantly changing, um, your model's gonna um, drift or it's gonna get stale. And so you need to continually um, monitor these changes and adapt for them. So, yeah, drifting is when something about either the data or the what you're trying to predict changes, and so the model um, drifts. And it's it's inevitable. It could happen over the course of years, or it could happen overnight, essentially. So, for example, one-way um, airline tickets, purchasing those used to be indicative of, of fraud. Um, and then COVID hit, basically, and overnight, people are buying a lot more one-way tickets to get home or get to a place to quarantine. And so you can see how these old models that based on the assumption that one-way tickets was fraudulent 
those are out of date now and they need to be um, retrained and redesigned. So there's three different types of drift, three distinct but related types of drift. So the first one is conceptual. And that's when the properties, like the statistical properties of what you're trying to predict actually changes. Um, so for example, um, people are gonna, criminals are smart. So they're gonna start thinking of new ways to actually commit fraud. Um, so you have to build and adapt for that. The third type of drift is data drift. So that's when the properties of the input changes. So not what you're trying to predict, what you're um, using to predict the, the input changes. And so that could be for any number of reasons. So that could be changing with the season. Um, the data could change with just personal preferences or trends. And um, yeah, so the flight, the flight fraud was that that's more um, of a data change where, yeah. And finally, there's upstream changes. Uh, these ones are, are, they're similar to data changes, but it's basically the operation or there's operational changes in the data pipeline. So it changes how it's, the data is being collected. It could change its format um, or even they might just not be collecting a feature anymore. And so that would be a upstream change. And so an example of this might be um, changing from collecting data in collecting temperature in degrees Celsius or to degrees Fahrenheit, um, changing that sort of representation of the same feature. So that's what we're looking for. Now, how do we actually um, put this into effect and make sure our models don't uh, drift? So we need a feedback loop um, from some sort of monitoring system and we need to constantly refresh models um, as needed. And so that's the key. So there's a few things. So first you wanna monitor the data, right? Data is like the most important part of your project, uh, right? Data in or garbage in equals garbage out. You've heard that before, I'm sure. And then what we can actually do is sort of enforce the schema of the data coming in and monitor the distribution of incoming data. So we know if there's some sort of change in what we're looking at. You're also gonna to wanna to monitor the distribution of the labels that you use when training. Um, and finally, there's the results. So you wanna, of course, enforce the sort of the schema and monitor the distribution of the request, as well as the uh, distribution of the predictions. So if you start predicting far more positives than you used to, far more um, class ones than you ever did, there could be some sort of change that you have to account for. You also wanna monitor the quality of the predictions. And so now by storing all this training data, the predictions and the performance metrics, you can sort of um, analyze the trends and maximize the accuracy of your model over time. And when I say monitoring the, uh, the performance metrics, that's, that's anything from metrics like speed and the memory footprint of your model, as well as the actual quality um, measured by something like accuracy um, or recall. So a couple cool techniques um, that I like to touch on it. The first would be um, weighting new data uh, heavier. So when you retrain your model, you're gonna wanna use the old data that you had or like you want to because more data is often better, but since it's probably outdated, you're gonna wanna weight it less than you would the new data because that's gonna be the most updated and you want it to be the most influential um, data when training. Another cool technique is actually modeling the change of the data. So this is, I think this is inspired basically um, by the ensemble method techniques. So that's where you first make your base model, um, train it, run it, and deploy it. And then as its accuracy starts to fall, or as you see there's um, more errors than there used to be and you need to retrain it, you make a new model to actually correct for that base model's predictions. And then you keep making new models to sort of refresh and hone in on the 
what is the most useful and updated model. And yeah, and that is it. Thank you so much for joining. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, send me an email. Um, happy to talk to you. And if you have any questions, I'd love to try and answer them now. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions for Matt, feel free to uh, unmute and say them or just put them in the chat and I can re relay. You must have done a really good job explaining that. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> thanks um, for, uh, for giving that presentation. That was really insightful. I learned a lot about sort of model drift, which isn't something I'd, I'd heard about before. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming and thank you Travis and the rest of QMind for organizing such a bomb ass event. Thank you. <laughs>